Hi everyone, my name is Sylvain Lézé from the Department of Aeronautics at Imperial College London, and this is a new episode of the podcast Turbulence at the Exascale. So if you're not familiar with the podcast, we are trying to gather the views of the community regarding the challenges and opportunities associated with exascale computing, with a focus on uh, the study of uh, turbulent and fluid flows. So this uh, podcast is uh, part of the UK Turbulence Consortium and also the uh, Excalibur Initiative, which is uh, an ambitious uh, five-year project here uh, in the UK aiming to rethink and redesign uh, the software landscape uh, in the UK for the uh, transition to uh, exascale computings. And as such, uh, uh, we are uh, working with uh, a lot of colleagues uh, to see what uh, we can do with respect to uh, uh, turbulence and fleet flow research. So today my guest is uh, from uh, Cambridge. His name is uh, Andy Wheeler. He's a, a lecturer uh, in the Whittle uh, Laboratory. Um, his research uh, focuses on thermofluid dynamic of uh, turbo machines in aero engines propulsion, land-based power. He has also interest, of course, in aerodynamics and steady flows, uh, turbine heat transfer and so on and so on. And of course, he's using high performance computing to carry out his, his research. So good afternoon, uh, Andy. Good afternoon. Um, uh, th thanks, Sylvain, for the chance to, to, to talk to you on this. Uh, uh, thank you, Andy. Um, so I'm going to crack on with my question. And uh, my first question is for those who don't know you or don't know you very well. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, where uh, you are from, what you have studied and how did you end up in uh, the Whittle uh, lab in Cambridge. Yeah, sure. So uh, as you said, I'm a, a lecturer here, associate professor at, uh, at Cambridge, working at the Whittle lab, which is part of the engineering department. So I started off, um, I suppose, I read, um, as an undergraduate, I read engineering sciences at, uh, at Oxford. And as a student, I sort of got really interested in sort of term machinery aerodynamics. So I, I was lucky enough to work with um, uh, Professor Roger Ainsworth at Oxford for my master's project. And, and Roger had sort of developed a, a turbine test facility capable of recreating the conditions in an aero engine turbine. So this, this facility was called the Oxford Rotor. And my project uh, was to look at fast response uh, aerodynamic probes within the Oxford rotor. And this sort of got me hooked into sort of term machinery, aero engines, high speed flows, turbine and compressor aerodynamics. Um, so after Oxford, I, I then came over to do a PhD here at the Whittle Lab in Cambridge, supervised by, by Rob Miller. And in my PhD, I was sort of studying how unsteady flows affect the performance of aero engine compressors. So at the time I was using high resolution laser measurements uh, to measure the flows within, within a rotating compressor facility here. And I started to use CFD as well, but these were sort of more RANS based simulations, so relatively low fidelity by today's standards. Um, but in that work through the experiments really, I discovered how critical unsteady flows were to the generation of turbulence within compressors. And then after that, my PhD, I, I did a research fellowship in, in Oxford. So I went back to Oxford to the Osney lab uh, to work on heat transfer in turbines with, with Rolls-Royce. And again, this was, this was working back on the Oxford rotor. So that again was the really exciting. We were doing uh, high resolution uh, heat transfer measurements within the Oxford rotor. So the Oxford rotor um, is a transient facility. It runs for maybe half a second and produces about two megawatts of power. So it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> an exciting experiment. Um, and, and the work we were doing sort of revealed how the clearance between the top of the, the rotor blade and the casing of the machine affected the, the heat transfer into the blades. As we changed the clearance, that heat transfer changed. And that was really important because that affects the, um, uh, the, the thermal degradation of the blades, which is a big problem in high pressure turbines where the gas temperatures are very, very high and it's very difficult to cool the tops of the blades. Um, and then after that, I took up a lectureship in Queen Mary and then later in Southampton and eventually ended up here in, in Cambridge a few years ago. So it's been uh, sort of moving around a little bit, uh, but it's been exciting. Great, thank you. And may I ask you, it looks like you've been doing lots of experiments at the start of your career and 
Now, of yeah. course, you are doing uh, high performance computing and high fidelity simulation. So how did you become interested suddenly in, in HPC and in, in, in uh, CFD? Yeah, that's a really good one. So, so I'm really interested in how we sort of decarbonize proportion and power. Uh, and I think this really means we need to get a much better physical understanding of the aerodynamics, thermofluid mechanics of components such as turbines and compressors, uh, which are used within aero engines, gas turbines, and a whole range of um, you know, domestic appliances and things like that. And actually, it was with it, when I was at uh, Southampton that I really got interested in the use of uh, high fidelity methods for this. So um, when I joined the aerodynamics group in, in Southampton, um, Neil Sandham and, and Richard Sandberg were there. And... Um, they were using DNS and very high resolution LES to really, really get a, a good physical understanding of, of turbulence. And we started to work together to apply this to turbine machinery flows. And that really got me hooked. You know, it was almost like an alternative to an experiment because, you know, you're, you're not really applying any modeling assumptions here. So it was much more like an experiment to me. And then coming at from it as an experimentalist, this seemed to be, you know, um, a really exciting way of doing sort of numerical experiments really and so it, it, it seemed obvious to me that this was going to really be the way forward to get us really unprecedented understanding of the the true turbulent nature of the flow and and, and that what that's what got me hooked and uh, and more and more now I'm you know it's high fidelity simulations um, that I, I'm doing really rather than experiments apart from in, in some other areas. Good. Thank you very much. And so you have been uh, uh, studying and, and working in, in various universities in the UK. You mentioned Oxford, Southampton, Queen Mary, and of course Cambridge. So I was wondering what, what's the best thing about your uh, your current position? Uh, why do you like working, in, if you like working in, at uh, <laughs> the White Lab in Cambridge? Well, I think the best thing about working at the Whittle Lab for me is how close the research is to the technology. Um, so much of the work we do will end up affecting component design or design practice. Um, so this comes from working very closely with industrial partners, you know, companies like Rolls-Royce, Mitsubishi, Dyson, Siemens, which we work closely with. Um, so I think that's one really um, um, interesting aspect for me is being so close to the technology and being able to deliver impact into industry and, and see sort of technological change. Um, and the other thing I think is that, you know, the people here are fantastic. So um, um, the researchers have got a huge breadth of skills from computational skills through to um, advanced manufacturing techniques and, and, and also experimental methods. So that breadth of skills really, um, it's really great to be part of that community here. Great. Thank you very much. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about your uh, research, but before I me asking you a very specific uh, question. Can you briefly tell us on which projects you are currently working on? Yeah, sure. So um, I've got sort of several projects on sort of DNS and, and, and LES. Um, and so we're working with, at the moment, we're, we, we've sort of got a few new projects, um, one with Rolls-Royce, which is on the development of the new ultra fan engine. Um, it's a project called Fanfare. Um, and the focus is to try and understand the, the fan aerodynamics. Um, and this is really an enormous challenge to apply high fidelity simulations to because um, one of the key um, uh, factors affecting the compute cost of a high fidelity simulation is, is Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number of the fan you know, is, is several million. So running, um, you know, a very high fidelity simulation of a fan is really um, quite prohibitively expensive. So instead, what we can do is try and un target some of the physical mechanisms and, and, and run simulations of the physical mechanisms. So one example of that is in a fan, um, a shock boundary layer interactions are relatively uh, important um, and that affects the performance, but stability of the machine as well. So we can um, simulate that phenomenon and we can extract boundary conditions for that to represent what the flow would 
they'd be experiencing in 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 the in the real case and then that allows us to look at effects like reynolds numbers and turbulence and uh, and things like that and shock strength on 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 that phenomenon um, so that's some work that we're doing with rolls royce some of the previous work we've done with rolls royce is to 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 use some of our dns and les data to uh, calibrate the the modeling that's used within the design, Rolls Royce design system, and that's been a really powerful way of trying to improve on the design methods and to put physical understanding into those design methods from from the high fidelity data. Some of the other work we're doing is um, with Dyson, and um, it, it, the components in it, um, the Dyson components they're they're really at the other end of the Reynolds number spectrum, so they're. Um, Reynolds numbers tend to be uh, quite small, so they're small domestic um, components. Um, so that means that that data is much more accessible for high fidelity simulation. So we can do lots of things there. We can generate big databases of high fidelity data. So the challenge there is more, how do you deal with that data? And so one of the, the pieces of work that we're trying to do at the moment is trying to use um, things like image recognition techniques um, to extract flow structures from the data and then track those structures and link that to the performance of the components. Uh, so that's sort of ongoing work um, with Dyson. And then we're running simulations with, um, with Siemens as well. And that work is to do with understanding um, compressor, um, compressor tip flows. So the problem that we're looking there is that in, in, in many cases in an industrial gas turbine, the compressor is sort of canter, cantilevered and has a gap between the bottom of the blade and the hub of the machine, the rotating hub. And you, that drives a flow underneath the gap and generates a, quite a complex 3D turbulent flow field. So we, we've got sort of a, a, a big calculations that we've been running of that problem at different clearances. Uh, so we have a, it's about 1.6 billion point simulation to try and capture that physics and how that um, how the leakage flows are changed as we change the clearance and calibrate and use that data to sort of calibrate the the conventional modeling approaches using RANDs. So those are the sort of uh, high fidelity simulation projects that I'm involved with. I'm also doing sort of work on. Um, uh, but it's more experimental work with some, some CFD to do with turbines used for um, uh, low-grade heat recovery and, um, uh, and uh, uh, th th those are turbines used within systems called organic Rankine cycles uh, where the fluid properties are uh, very different to a sort of ideal gas. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in physics coming into, into that and it affects the turbine performance in in quite interesting and surprising ways. Great, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting to hear about your, your uh, current research. And my next question is, uh, of course, you are doing, you mentioned a lot of high fidelity simulations. Now, so now I know you are using a, a solver code called uh, 3DNS. So can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, solver and what numerical methods are you using, parallelization strategy and, and so on and so on? Yeah, sure. So um, I think one of the main bottlenecks to the sort of future development of aerodynamic components like um, compressors and turbines used in aero engines and gas turbines is the ability to uh, model turbulence correctly. So, you know, normal design systems rely on RANS, RANS methods, which have turbulence um, modeled in there. Um, but in a machine like an aero engine, there are many in a machine like an aero engine compressor, there are many rows of sort of rotating components generating large amounts of unsteadiness and turbulence. And the turbulence affects the efficiency and stability of the machine because it drives sort of additional viscous dissipation and mixing, which is very important. Um, so normally in design methods, turbulence models are applied within the CFD, but these are often incapable of capturing this sort of true uh, impact of turbulence on performance. So what we really need a better a physical understanding of the unsteady and turbulent uh, flow in the machine. Um, so um, to address this, um, I realized that what we really needed was a code that was able to capture the sort of component level realism of a real machine. 
so things like geometry, flow conditions and gas properties, but could also efficiently uh, resolve structures down uh, from the largest to the smallest scales. Um, so this would really allow us to dispense with the modeling approaches, uh, which bring their own uncertainties and try, like I say, try and gain real physical insight into the turbulent nature of the flow. So that's really what 3DNS is targeted at. So it's a compressible Navier-Stokes solver, uh, which is specifically designed for turbine machinery flows. So it's a high order finite difference solver, um, which has a sort of series of pre and post processing methods for generating realistic boundary conditions, such as inflow turbulence and geometry and meshing. So things that are tailored for turbine machinery type applications and also post processing methods for pulling out things that you would be interested in as a turbine machinery designer, things like entropy generation rates, um, you know, and, and, and pulling to allow you to look at certain uh, loss mechanisms in that way. So it, it can run on, um, um, on CPUs and GPUs. So it's highly scalable, enables highly scalable simulations. Um, and, and, you know, is, um, is, is, is suited to um, the sort of complex geometries that you might have in turbine machinery passages. So that could be axial machines, radial machines, mixed flow geometries as well. But it still retains a sort of high order numerical treatment um, so the code captures the required engineering realism while still maintaining the sort of high, de high degree of, uh, of accuracy. So that's the idea behind the, behind the solver. Great. And, uh, is it written in Fortran in C or in... Yeah, so it's written in Fortran. Um, so, um, and um, uh, in, in Fortran 90 is, uh, for, the, um, for the GPU version, which is... Uh, accelerated with uh, OpenACC uh, okay. acceleration. Great, thank you very much. And um, may I ask you how you are dealing with uh, real gases in, um, in, in this solver, which is, I think, one of the main uh, originality of the code? Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we have a few different methods for this. So for dealing with perfect gas, uh, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. We just set yeah. a specific gas constant ratio of specific heat. For real gases, we need more complex thermodynamic model. So luckily, um, we have uh, data from the uh, NIST REFROP database, which has a very wide range of equations of state and transport property models. Uh, what we find is that if we implement these functions directly into the code, there's quite a significant compute cost penalty. So an alternative way is to um, reconstruct equations of state and lookup tables in order to be much more compute efficient. Um, and, um, and what's very important when we do that is to ensure sort of thermodynamic consistency in the way we do that. Uh, and that's, that's important, not just from an accuracy, but also stability of the numerical scheme. Um, but yes, yeah, so we, we, we make use of the, the wide range of uh, uh, properties available in the in the refprop libraries in order to do that. Great, thank you very much. So uh, you, you talked a little bit uh, about it already, but I'm, I'm going to ask you the my next question anyway. So, so you are doing high fidelity simulations of turbines, compressor blades, and you are trying to use, uh, well, the, the latest generation of supercomputers. And so can you tell us maybe a little bit about the, the challenges that are associated with this a specific type of flow. I think you already mentioned a few things in your introduction regarding your solver, but if you can tell us a little bit more about that, that would be amazing. Yeah, well, I think the big problems are, well, there's two areas really. I think first, the big problems are knowing the right boundary conditions. So, you know, within a machine, I mean, it's, it's relatively unknown what the unsteady environment is because it's quite difficult to get measurements within real machines. So, you know, is the turbulence representative? Is the geometry representative? Because the geometry can change. So, um, so these sorts of things are, are challenges. The other one, which I touched on before, is trying to get engine representative flow conditions. And the particular challenge there is Reynolds number because if you're thinking about an aero engine, you've got a huge range of Reynolds numbers. So you've got things, 
at uh, relatively low Reynolds numbers, like a low pressure turbine, where the Reynolds numbers can be of the order of about 100,000, through to you know, the high pressure turbine and the fan, which can be operating with Reynolds numbers of you know, over, over 2 million. And um, it, the compute cost scales with the Reynolds number to the power three to four. So that, that's an enormous, enormous variation in compute cost. So, I mean, that, those, in my mind, are the, are the really big challenges here, is to try and get sort of realism in both those aspects. Great. Um, Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about science, I will say. Um, so you, you have been working a lot about uh, non-equilibrium effects. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about those effects um, when you are dealing with uh, Bondi layers in, in turbo machineries flows. Yeah, sure. So in turbo machinery design, we often make an assumption of equilibrium flow. So for instance, we know um, for equilibrium boundary layers, uh, the, the loss generation, so the viscous dissipation in a turbulent boundary layer is, you know, can be between two to five times greater than in a laminar boundary layer. And an equilibrium boundary layer is one really where a turbulent equilibrium boundary layer is one which is relative is developing relatively slowly and where the production of turbulent structures is pretty much in balance with the destruction or the dissipation of the structures through uh, viscous forces, viscous effects. But this ignores the fact that uh, boundary layers in a, in a real machines often are rapidly developing and are not, uh, not really in a, an equilibrium state. Um, and our physical understanding of non-equilibrium boundary layers is really quite limited. Uh, and, 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 and we don't actually know what that does to the performance or the stability of the machine. So we, we looked at this particular problem for um, compressors. So a, a case of a um, embedded compressor. And what we found by running um, high fidelity simulations, we found that non-equilibrium behavior is, is really very important to loss generation. Um, we also found that it all affects large regions of the flow. So it's, it's not a local thing, it, it affects large regions of the flow. Uh, and uh, this was really interesting um, uh, in ways that we hadn't really realized before. This, this was really, really key. We took that understanding and, and we, 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 we looked at the modeling approaches in industry and we saw that um, this non-equilibrium effect wasn't really being factored in properly in, in design, current design methods. So we were able to adapt the, the modeling approaches in order to correctly capture this. Uh, and and, and uh, this enabled us to, 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 uh, to um, include these non-equilibrium effects into the Rolls-Royce design system. So we've done that quite recently. That was, that was quite exciting. I mentioned that we're now looking at fan aerodynamics and it, it, what's interesting in a fan is because the the speeds the flow speeds are, are quite high and you can have things like shock waves um, those impose a very rapid change in pressure in the boundary layer so that it also introduces a, a type of non-equilibrium effect and again even though that the the Reynolds numbers are quite high in this case this the presence of the shock waves it reintroduces a quite strong non-equilibrium effect so that's uh, um, again, it's something that we didn't really realize uh, until quite recently. Um, so that, that's been uh, quite interesting and quite important, I think, for the next development of, of high bypass um, ratio engines. Great. Thank you very much. And I have another uh, question for you. You've been doing some work about what we call the compressibility factor. So can you tell us a little bit more about the compressibility factor and how it can affect uh, turbine performances? Yeah, so uh, the compressibility factor is a property of state which tells us whether a gas obeys the ideal gas law or not. So for an ideal gas, the compressibility factor is one. But from uh, and, and most fluids at high temperatures and low pressures behave in this way. So they tend to have compressibility factors of one. When you pressurize gases, the compressibility factor tends to reduce below one. Uh, and this means that for certain mass of gas, certain amount of gas, it takes up less space, not just because it's at high pressure, but also because the compressibility factor reduces. 
And uh, I suppose you could say that the gas becomes more squashable because the forces of attraction between the gas molecules are pulling it together in this way. So I got really interested in this because uh, no one had really studied how this affects the performance of turbines. Um, and this is important because many turbines use high pressure gases, um, uh, which are far from a sort of ideal gas uh, state. Um, and a particular example of that are turbines used in organic Rankine cycles, where the, den the, the, the gas densities are really, really high. The, these are systems that are used for uh, recovery of a low grade heat in geothermal power or to recover uh, waste heat from industrial processes, for instance. So they're really key to low, you know, future low carbon power. But the design of the turbines wasn't really accounting for this, the, this, um, uh, re these really strong real gas effects. Um, so, um, so um, um, there was very little experimental data to to uh, on on what the effect of compressibility factor was on on turbine performance. Um, so we built a test facility in order to tackle that, an experimental test facility. So. Um, um, this test facility allowed us to have a, a sort of turbine blades in a in a short duration wind tunnel. Um, so it was effectively a high pressure pipe, really, which give us a short duration flow, mm. um, but where we could replace the working fluid. So we could change the different gases and we could change the geometry. We could try and understand the role of the gas property on the behavior of the turbine. And, and that um, we combined with sort of uh, com computational simulations. Um, what we found was actually the compressibility factor uh, has a really interesting effect on the turbine loss. And um, uh, it, really it comes down to the way that the compressibility factor um, affects the distribution of momentum within a boundary layer. So you have quite a big variation in density within a boundary layer. Um, when you're at low compressibility factor. And that distribution uh, affects the distribution of momentum and it governs the, the, the viscous dissipation within the boundary layer, but it also has an effect on the, the mixing process later on as well. So that, that, was, that was the main impact on the, on the turbine loss. And it was quite significant. Um, Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions about exascale computing and um, so my first question is a, a very silly question. So it looks like uh, 3DNS can already run on CPU and GPUs, and but my question is, do you think that uh, 3DNS is ready for exascale computers, or do you think there's uh, some work to be done in terms of software development and parallelization? I, I think we're, I think in terms of the solver side of things, I think we're probably okay. Um, I, I think one of the key um, things where we really need to think is, is, is the other end of the problem, which is dealing with the data that's going to result from uh, exascale simulations. Um, I think we all have a pretty good understanding of how to solve Navier-Stokes, <laughs> but we don't have a good understanding of how to deal with all the data that we're going to produce. And I, I think that's really the, the, the key here. Um, and we're trying to look at that a little bit, but I, but yeah, I think that's where we need we need to build uh, expertise and, and get get ready. That would be my view. Great. And um, if if I give you access to a big exascale computers tomorrow, mm. what, what 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 will you do? What would be your your first simulation? Let's say if you can use the whole system and uh, do whatever you want. Well, I, I, I really just want to get closer and closer to engine scale conditions. So that means adding resolution, adding more physics, for instance, chemical reactions, or ha having more geometrical complexity, you know, real, the real geometry, mm -hmm. um, surface roughness, geometrical features. And again, like, you know, trying to access higher and higher Reynolds numbers to try and understand what happens as we resolve more and more scales at more and more engine representative types of conditions. So I think we're always going to be fighting for more in that in that sense. <laughs> good, 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 good. And uh, it's a, a, another silly question I will say is uh, 
So you can use CPUs and GPUs. And I was wondering uh, if, if, if there is one thing you can change in terms of hardware or in terms of uh, high performance computing, uh, what would you change? I mean, do you have issues with memory, with network? Well, you mentioned a generation of data, but is there any other issues that you think are uh, important? Yeah, I'm not sure about this. So I think, I mean, one of the great things I find with HPC is the centralized support is normally brilliant. I mean, the, the team here supporting CSD3 are brilliant, the Archer 2 team. I mean, this centralized res resource is, is so valuable to us all. I mean, I think my biggest upsets are queue times, but that's just naturally because um, you know these are um, popular systems, and 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 uh, we're trying to coordinate the resource a, a, a no, a, across a number of um, a, a, a large number of people. Um, but if there was a magic switch that gave me very short compute <laughs> queue times, that'd be fantastic because that really does add. A uh, significant lead time I find on on some of the simulations, but I don't think there's a really a solution there. I, I suppose my key feeling here is that we in the UK we need to be able to compete internationally in terms of HPC. So I think we need to maintain and grow UK HPC facilities to make mm -hmm. sure that we are you know we are top in the world for, for HPC. So that's really where I would like to see. Um, um, us, us uh, going forwards really in the UK. Great, I think that's that's a very strong statement and I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Um, my, my final question is, uh, where do you think you will be running your, your simulation in, 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 I don't know, 20, 30 years? I mean, uh, where do you think HPC is going in the future? I mean, do you think we are going to be dealing with CPU and GPUs in 30 years or 40 years? Or do you think we are going to have, a, I don't know, brand new hardware and we will have to rethink our algorithms. What's your view on the, on the very long term? I, again, I I'm, don't really have a clear view on this, but what I do see, and it's what I said before, that um, the real challenge I, I see isn't so much algorithms to solve Navier Stokes, I really feel the key thing here is trying to understand how we deal with the immense amount of data. And that's a only that is something that is only ever going to get bigger as we get bigger and bigger bigger machines, access to bigger and bigger HPC, unless we have methods to deal with it. And I think, you know, I would really like to see um, research. Um, in my field that targets more and more this problem. I think this is also a problem that um, um, will prevent um, uh, a wider participation in high fidelity simulation. You know, if I'm working with an industrial partner, I need to be able to demonstrate the, 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 the value in running such complex simulations. And that relies on an ability to extract physical understanding from really complex data sets. And I, I think that's the big challenge that I can see at the moment that, that, that we don't have a great deal of solutions for. Um, so, um, and, and, and it's a difficult problem. So <laughs> that, that would be my view, Sylvain. Great. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much again. Yeah, Andy, it was very nice talking to you about your research about uh, 3DNS and about all the Tibo machinery uh, work that uh, you are doing. And I'm, I'm very glad also to see that you are still doing some experiments and you are doing some direct cross comparison between experiments and simulation. I think it's very, very important to keep this um, active. So thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks very much, Nelvain. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to this podcast. As usual, the recording will be made available on the UK Turbulence Consortium website. Just Google UK Turbulence. And it's the same. You can find us on Twitter, UK uh, Turbulence. Very easy. All the links will be put on uh, YouTube and uh, SoundCloud. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening and hope to see you soon in a new episode.